Hello everybody, welcome to another video and today it is the 7th of January. Before I get into the video, make sure to like and subscribe. And I do want to just talk today about the situation in Solidar and its environs. And so that's primarily what I'm going to be focusing on. I'm also going to talk about the ceasefire, but really Solidar and the breakthrough over there is a really big part of the Battle of Bakhmut and so I want to focus on it and explain the context behind why this is happening and what could potentially happen in the future and so we're going to start out with what happened before so the Russians obviously we know that their previous positions were around this polygon over here this orange polygon which is really centered around the Lysychansk Bakhmut road the Russians were able to really probe the Ukrainian line around Sodar but they weren't able to infiltrate into the city center same thing with the Yakovlivka. they were not able to push into the town and it is a relatively small town but it is on higher elevation than the surrounding areas and so it, by controlling this area ukraine was able to have an advantage and it was able to really overlook some of the other towns around here like Novokamyanka and Stryapivka and so that put the Russians in a bad position and so they spent about a month trying to advance onto Yakovlivka they had some success reaching the road but they were not able to take the town up until very recently and that is when it was taken and so the taking of the town was very important it sort of had this domino effect because after the town fell we saw that the 10th motor guards uh, 10th guards motor rifle division started advancing north and to the west so they started advancing on Vesele, which presented a threat to the Ukrainian grouping over here, the Trikasi Brigade, and also around Bilohorovka. And so we saw this two-pronged attack, which really fixed the Ukrainian troops over here. They sent in some reinforcements, they mined the area, and so they were worried about a breakthrough going on over here, because once Vesele falls, there aren't many towns in the area, and so you could potentially have a Ukrainian uh, retreat away from the Seversk line, because Seversk the southern flank would be exposed if Vesele fell and then Vimka fell. And so you saw a lot of resources pouring into Vesele. You also saw a lot of resources pouring, um, pouring into this town over here called Rozdolivka because Rozdolivka was pretty close to the Russian front line. And if it were to fall, then it would destroy the logistical supplies flowing in from the north to Sodar and Bakhmut. And so that's really where they concentrated the bulk of their defense. They did not focus as much on the eastern flank of Solidar. And the issue is that the eastern flank of Solidar was totally exposed. The Russians, they were able to secure the high ground, and then they were able to start shelling and firing mortars onto the Ukrainian positions over here and using sniper fire to attack the Ukrainian positions over here whenever they were exposed. And they were able to pretty quickly occupy the forest belt over here, although there was some resistance for a few days, and all the surrounding open fields. And so the Ukrainians were in the situation where they could theoretically hold on to the current front line, which was around southern Solidar, or they could withdraw to a more defendable, compact line that would prevent them from being flanked. And so they decided to retreat about two days ago, and this happened after the original momentum for the Russian grouping in Solodar, where they took over this elementary school over here and finally cleared out the rest of the Bakhmutske suburb. That is when Ukraine really saw the writing on the wall, especially as the forested belt was taken over by the Russians. And so we saw the Ukrainians begin to leave their first line of contact as it was being overrun by the Russians. They really couldn't form a solid defensive line in this entire residential area over here it's not dense enough and a lot of the area over there is just open which allows for russian maneuvers it allows for russian mobile units to advance pretty quickly and so that's part of why they had to withdraw a bit further north to the salt mines and we're going to get into that and so we did see the front line at the the konskaya train station for about a day but the russians were able to pretty quickly secure it and using those new positions they were able to advance up north and now we have some geolocated footage from the area around the salt mine which was released by the wagon group earlier today it shows the russian troops at the salt mine it was geolocated by syriac maps he has some very good updates and geolocation so i recommend following him and we have some other geolocations we have this one of a ukrainian point of view as they were retreating from solidar so you can see 
how they're located pretty close to the front line, but that by now they've probably retreated deeper in to the front line, uh, deeper into the Ukrainian line over here, probably settling around this mine shaft over here. Now, as this all was happening, the Russians were also expanding towards these open fields over here, which are relatively close to this town called Krasnopolivka. And so even after Ukraine withdrew to the north around the salt mine and around some of the larger buildings, they were still in an, this situation where they could be flanked because of Russia's forward positions over here. And so you can see how the Ukrainian grouping over here could in theory be flanked because Russia already has the momentum in the south because they just advanced using the six separate Cossack motorized rifle regiment of the LPR the Wagner group, obviously, but also the Chechens that we haven't really seen much action from them in recent months. So maybe they're starting to be rotated now and they have fresh recruits, fresh men that are willing to fight. And of course, you also have the Russian regular army and its huge artillery advantage. And so it won't be easy to stop the Russians momentum over here. Although given the fact that there are some pretty large Ukrainian fortifications in this area, they might be able to hold the back for a while. You do have a lot of Ukrainian units in this area. The most notable one is the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, which fought tenaciously in Kherson and was able to achieve some major successes, although they did take a lot of losses, and I'm sure they're taking a lot of losses right now in Solidar. They really did lose a lot of their combat effectiveness in this fighting over here in Solidar, and some of their battalions are being rotated at the moment due to very heavy losses. They also at least according to Russian sources, lost 70 of their men as uh, POWs. And so the situation here is not looking good for the Ukrainians. What they're trying to do now is trying to salvage the remaining control they have over Solidar and form a defensive line around the salt mines. I guess the problem is that there are several salt mines, and so some of them have fallen to the Russians. Some are still under Ukrainian control. So for one, we have this um, artismo salt touristical area this is where the tourists enter from and so there's a whole facility over here for the processing and mining of the salt but there's also an entrance from here underground and so it's very interesting to see what's going on underground there are rumors about some very huge ukrainian fortifications over there stockpiles of weapons these tunnel systems so for the most part these salt mines are either for workers or for tourists but in theory since april it could have been transformed into a military stronghold like azovstal in mariupol i'm gonna pull up a image from the wagner group which is a few days old so it's not the actual front lines right now but it sort of visualizes the entire extent of these underground tunnels so here you can see the salt mines in the vicinity of Bakhmut. you can see how a lot of these underground tunnels are in the northern part of Solodar, but they're also spanning to the west and to the southwest around Parasokivka, where there's another entrance around this other town. It's called Salt when I translated it from Ukrainian. It's actually a part of Solodar, but it is further to the east, and it is pretty isolated from the main town itself. And so there is another entrance from there that i have marked on my map which ukraine still has control of i'm going to show you guys in a second here you can see that the town of solidar is sort of split by this rail station and if you go further north this in theory should be a part of solidar but it really is its own town basically about a thousand people live here at least when i checked the ukrainian wikipedia and when I translated the name, it's at salt. But it's not too important. You can see that there's a train station here. And so again, it is important as a supply hub. A lot of supplies are running through here into the front line. And there is an entrance from here into the tunnel fortification. So that's the main point. There's also one over here called the Solidar Salt Mine Number 7. The ones in the center of Solidar are numbers 1 through 3. So at least part of those are under Russian control. But... 
based on the geolocations, Ukraine does still hold positions in some of these other houses over here. So we might be seeing street to street fighting over here in the government offices in this Spelio Santorium, which is basically like some alternative medication that's supposed to like use salt to help cure you. Here's another entrance that I found, which is around the salt mine uh, marked on Google Maps. But again, if Russia is able to quickly take over these entrances and just clear off whatever connection the garrison underground has to the one above ground, then that would really neuter a lot of the threat that they would pose. I don't even know if there is a huge Ukrainian garrison underground. I've just seen it hyped up in rumors by Russian sources. But it would make sense given the fact that Ukraine has done this before with Azovstal, as I said before. But as the Ukrainians are in disarray, it might be difficult for them to put up an effective resistance at this point, given the fact that they've spent so many months just trying to hold a single line and that now we've seen that the second that they withdraw from one of their forward positions, they just have a very hard time regrouping effectively. In all honesty, at this point, they might have to fully regroup around the rail line over here, which would mean conceding all the entrances to the salt mines, would mean conceding some of the land and this salt town over here i mean conceding a lot of open area which is pretty close to bahmut pitarodny krasnohora blahodatne speaking of krasnohora krasnohora is being attacked right now russian sources confirm that there are the approaches of krasnohora and we know that there's a lot of shelling going on in the region and so it's safe to say that the fighting has shifted towards there using their new positions around the Listen, Chansk Bakhmut Road, the Russians were able to take over some key Ukrainian defensive nodes around these reservoirs and these force belts, and they were able to advance through these open fields and reach the town of Krasnohora. So now residents in the area are reporting fire and different shots going off in the region. So there is some pretty heavy fighting going on right there. The Ukrainians do have some fortifications over here. It looks like they have some ramparts or these may be reservoirs that were set up that could be turned into fortifications. We've seen that and do that with other reservoirs in Donbass. And so I'm sure this is a fortified area. Might be trenches that were added in. Maybe also around the Solodar scale lake. There might be fortifications over there. But Krasnohora is a relatively small town. You could expect fighting over here. Because the Russians would want to cut off the supplies of Bakhmut. Which are running in from Parasukivka. So by taking Krasnohora you'd be flanking Parasukivka and you'd have position to attack it from the northeast. And so again, this is presenting a major threat to the main supply line coming into Bakhmut. And even if it's not taken, it will be well within the range of artillery, which will make any sort of supplies through those roads very difficult. Sure, you could have supplies from smaller roads or from some open path, but again, it just slows it down and makes it more difficult to defend Bakhmut, especially given the fact that there's a meat grinder going on over there. So every single equipment, piece of equipment, piece of supplies, um, all these reinforcements, each one counts especially in a traditional battle like this. So losing a key supply line would be detrimental to the defense going on over here. And all in all, it's not looking good for the garrison over here. It could precipitate the loss of Bakhmut in general if Saladar ends up falling. It would have a domino effect. And then after Bakhmut falls, it would also open up the opportunity to attacking Seversk because it would be isolated from the main front line. And then Ukraine would have to withdraw off to one of its secondary or tertiary lines and put up a defense over there and one of the reasons why this hasn't happened faster is because of ukraine's really steadfast last stand you could say it might not even be a last stand but their steadfastness in this town of klishivka which really given the huge amount of russian assaults over here should have fallen but it is still standing with these units over here, 60th Separate Infantry Brigade, 95th Air Assault Brigade, 28th Mechanized Brigade. The rail station over here was taken by the Russians, and so they do have an opportunity to flank it. And they do have a presence in some of the northern residential blocks, but even if that falls, then you still have some extensive Ukrainian fortifications to the west of it that will be utilized. You could see how they were designed to sort of prevent 
the full effect of artillery shells from being realized on the entire trench line. So they're sort of made in these zigzag formations to prevent the artillery shells from affecting troops in other parts of the trench line. You could see similarly how they're set up over here. And so that's all preventing Russia from attacking head on into these fortifications, which is keeping the supply line from Konstantinivka and Chassis VR going through Ivanivska into Bakhmut open. And this other one over here, which is a bit of a smaller road from Chelsea VR directly into Kromove and into Bakhmut. So even if the northern one falls, they would still have two more pretty uh, open routes, although those two would still be within the range of shelling. Another important thing to note is that in terms of elevation, Russia now has the advantage. They do have the high ground to the east of Krasnohora, which will be used to fire upon the town. They also have the high ground to the northeast of Solodar. And so that will be used to attack the Ukrainian positions over here if they don't withdraw from Solodar. It could also be used to attack Krasnopolivka, Mikolaevka, a lot of these towns that are adjacent to the rail station and to the highway. It could also be used to attack Rozdolivka, which was one of the towns that Ukraine really feared that Russia would be able to take. So now they might be able to shift their focus over there now that the Ukrainians are sort of being spread thin by these recent advances. Same thing with Vesele. Given the fact that Ukraine is so overwhelmed elsewhere, they might be moving resources away from Vesele, and so an attack on Vesele might be more fruitful this time. All in all, the situation on Donbass for Ukraine is not looking good. They do still have a pretty stable line, but Russia started to chip away at it, and we now we saw the consequences of the first contact line breaking. There was no real good second line to fall back to. We have to wait and see when they're able to regroup effectively, but this could be indicative of what could happen on a much larger scale in Bakhmut. Now, a lot of this is going on around the same time that the Russians announced their ceasefire, their 36-hour ceasefire, which was supposed to go into effect at midday January 6th and end at the end of January 7th. But it seems like really that ceasefire didn't have any effect on the fighting perhaps there were some russian orthodox troops in russia's military that were given the 36 hours off for observational purposes but even without those troops you still have the chechens that are not observant and you might have some russian troops that decided to still keep on fighting and so during that time you still had a lot of russians trying to advance and we saw some of the largest gains during this ceasefire period. And this is due to the fact that Ukraine did not agree to the terms of the ceasefire. The terms were presented on January 5th, so they were sort of caught off guard for by that. But either way, it's not a good look in terms of PR because it sort of puts Ukraine in this position where they are looking like they're not interested in peace because they're opposing a ceasefire and that they'd be willing to put this war effort over like religious purposes or respecting the russian orthodox christmas and so that's the rationale behind russia's decision making it also could in theory have given their units some more time to prepare offensive operations but after what we saw today i don't think this is likely because they were clearly able to conduct their offensive operations properly without the ceasefire really going into full effect so we did see obviously the same shelling today as any other day, despite the fact that it was the Orthodox Christmas. Now, in the backdrop of all of this, we're seeing the United States and NATO continue to supply Ukraine. There are new shipments that are coming in, although this will take a while to actually be transported across the Atlantic into Poland, and then through the border to the front line, and then to have the Ukrainian troops actually learn how to operate it correctly. All of that takes time and it adds up but it could still have some sort of effect in preventing Russian advances, slowing down their advances in some of these areas. And so I want to read off the newest aid package to Ukraine that is being finalized by the Biden administration. This is coming out of the $13.6 billion in emergency aid funding that came from the omnibus bill that was passed by the United States Congress and signed by the president very recently. It was at the end of the last congressional season that this was passed, and 
it gives the president 13.6 billion dollars to work with that they could allot at certain periods of time in these aid packages so this is the first one it amounts to 3.75 billion and 2.85 billion of that is in actual like department of defense weapon stocks being sent to ukraine the other two uh 225 million is aimed at financing the modernization of the ukrainian army and then another 682 million will be given to eu countries into european countries in general that were giving ukraine their own military equipment to sort of to compensate for that and so i want to read off the sort of equipment that is being given so we have 50 m2 bradley infantry fighting vehicles that were given uh announced that would be given to ukraine then in addition to that there would be 500 tow anti-tank missile complexes and going along with these bradley infantry fighting vehicles would be 250,000 25 millimeter caliber rounds we also saw them announce 100 m113 apcs 1855 millimeter self-repelled guns and with those guns would come cars as well as supplements they announced 70,155 millimeter shells and 500 Excalibur projectiles, 1,200 RAAM anti-tank shells. And so these would be fired out of 155 millimeter projectiles. And those would be aimed specifically at neutering Russian tanks and destroying them before they could actually uh, attack Ukrainian positions on a frontal assault. Now, to put this into perspective before I continue going on, the Ukrainians are estimated to be using about 5,000 to 6,000 shells per day. And so, giving them 70,000 to 155 millimeter shells, it would only really help for like 10, 11 days. But to be fair, that's not the only like type of shells that are being given to Ukraine. There are also other shells that I'm going to get into in a second. But all in all, this is not enough to supply Ukraine un, uh, indefinitely. It could be enough once i add up the entire total to maybe provide them with rounds for about a month but as the fighting gets more and more heated over here ukraine's going to need more and more rounds and so these shipments are just not going to be enough even if they come immediately they will not be enough so i want to continue with the reading there america will also be giving ukraine 36 105 millimeter howitzers and in this package comes another ninety five thousand shells I would note that Ukraine's largest shortage in shells is specifically from 105 millimeter shells. And so this would be good at filling up their stockpiles again. They're also going to be given 10,120 millimeter shells. They're also going to be given additional ammo for HIMARS, which seems pretty reasonable because of the effect that has had on attacking the Russian rear. They're also going to be given 4,000 Zuni aircraft missiles. I don't know how effective this could be because Ukraine's air force, sure, it could still be operable in certain limited localized areas where they're able to get off the ground and attack Russian positions before the air defense systems are activated. But I, I don't know how big of an effect it would have before the Ukrainian planes would get shot down. We also have the fact that there are 2,000 ATGMs that will be sent to Ukraine. So this would be good at preventing Russian tanks from advancing. They're also going to be given RIM-7C Sparrow anti-air missiles. So these could be pretty effective. They might be able to prevent the largest extent of the Russian missile runs from being actualized. In addition, a lot of small arms and ammo will be given to Ukraine. So in specific, Claymar anti-personnel mines will be given, snipers will be given, grenade launchers, machine guns, night vision goggles. And so, yeah, it is, a pretty, it is pretty loaded. There is a lot of other equipment that Ukraine probably expected or did seek, they, that they probably wanted. Probably some of America's jets or perhaps their Patriot Air, air Defense missiles. Although I think that those will come at a later date and they might be announced in a separate package. America is intending to send those to the Ukrainians. The problem is with a lot of these different American weapon complexes is that you could send them here, but 
it's going to take a very long time to train the Ukrainian personnel in operating them. They're used to Soviet weaponry and still transitioning to the NATO weaponry. That takes time. And in a war like this, there really isn't that much time. The fighting is constant and attritional and every day wasted is draining lives and is draining grounds. It's not the issue with that, but all in all, I just wanted to give a pretty a pretty large and a pretty extensive summary of the situation around Bahamut and Solodar over the past few days. And we will see what goes on over here. I will keep you guys updated. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.